The Great Wall of China is a series of military fortifications that were built, destroyed, and rebuilt in several eras and locations between the 3rd century BC and the 17th century, stretching from the Korean border to the Gobi Desert in order to demarcate and defend the northern border of the country. It is the largest architectural structure ever built by man in terms of length, area, and mass. The total length of the walls approaches 6,700 kilometers. Because of this length, it is nicknamed the 10,000 Li Long Wall, a Li being an ancient Chinese unit of length measuring 576 meters and 10,000 symbolizing infinity. Its width varies between 5 and 7 meters and is between 5 and 17 meters high. The Great Wall is punctuated by watchtowers and bastions along its entire length and is especially impressive on the thousands of kilometers near Beijing, the capital. Popularly, the name Great Wall refers to the part built during the Ming Dynasty between the 14th and 17th centuries to prevent the Mongol and Manchu armies from invading the rich Chinese Empire. But the Chinese people had already constructed walls against northern invasions as early as their oldest dynasties, from the second millennium BC. Simple earthen levees that could reach 10 meters high. The building during the Ming and then Qing dynasties produced the most gigantic military engineering work in the world. Its historic and strategic importance is matched only by its architectural value. There are many legends related to the construction of the wall. The most famous tells how, during construction, one of the many laborers forced to work dies of exhaustion. So his body is used as filler in the wall. Meanwhile, his wife leaves in the middle of winter and crosses part of China to bring him clothing, but arrives after his death. Her tears and her despair are such that the heavens make the wall crumble at the point where the body of her husband is located, and the wife dies as well. The Great Wall has a reputation for being the largest cemetery in the world. Around 10 million workers died during its construction. They were not buried in the wall itself, contrary to what legend recounts, but rather in its immediate surroundings. Afterwards, the Great Wall of China was left to ruin until later, when it was saved by tourism. But it was damaged considerably during the years it was neglected. Its bricks and stones were used to build houses and roads, and even its earthen heart was used by farmers to enrich their fields. During the Cultural Revolution, under the government of Mao Zedong, rebels and Red Guards lashed out against monuments and religious sites. Their stones were used to construct buildings. Due to tourists' passion for this impressive structure, the Chinese government began to restore certain segments. Since 1987, the wall has been classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and was named one of the new Seven Wonders of the World in 2007. Today, it is one of the main tourist attractions of the country. In 2009, the administration in charge of cultural heritage, using the latest measurements technology, revised the measurements of the edifice and declared a length of 8,852 kilometers, of which there were 6,260 of wall, 360 kilometers of trenches, and 2,233 kilometers of natural barriers, such as mountains and rivers. This new estimate takes into account the parts that are currently destroyed. 
Furthermore, studies made by satellite showed numerous segments that were buried underground or under vegetation, with a total length of around 1,000 kilometers. The wall, no wider than a highway, is of course not visible from the moon with a naked eye, as some say, but rather from a low orbit. According to the astronaut Leroy Xiao, on returning from his six-month stay in the International Space Station, it is visible from space when the weather is clear, thanks to the shadow it casts when the sun is low along the horizon. Seen from the Earth, in any case, it is a magnificent spectacle that unrolls before your eyes. The wall stretches out as far as the eye can see, following the irregular curves of the mountain, surrounded by splendid landscapes. We stride across its stones, thinking about centuries past and all the men who came before us and tread upon this same line of separation between civilization and barbarism, where today a majestic silence reigns. A lovely place for reflection and meditation. Located on the northern tip of South America, Colombia is the only country of the continent to have coastlines on both oceans. Formerly Santa Fe de Bogota, Bogota is the capital of the country. It was founded on August 6, 1538, by the Spaniard Gonzalo Jiménez de Quesada during the Spanish conquest. It is the undisputed metropolis of the country. It also plays an important role in Latin America. Built on a high Andean plateau, the city is surrounded by mountain peaks topping out at 3,000 meters, which can be reached by cable cars. Like the rest of the country, Bogota is ethnically diverse. The interaction between the descendants of Native Americans, Spanish colonists, and African slaves, combined with 20th century immigration, have produced a diverse cultural heritage. The Constitution of Colombia today guarantees freedom of religion and equality of all religious groups before the law. The Church of Veracruz was built in the 16th century. Between 1550 and 1575, it was one of the first buildings in the city. The entrance includes a stone lintel topped by two small pinnacles and a niche holding a sculpture of Saint Veracruz. Inside stand massive rectangular pillars. The altar is soberly decorated. There is a meditative atmosphere here. The church's back wall adjoins another church, that of San Francisco. This church is considered the most typical and the oldest of Bogota's over 200 churches. The Church of San Francisco is an example of Chirigoresque style, a very ornate Baroque style from 18th century Spain. Inside, altarpieces, sculpted wooden ceilings, and a magnificent altar can be seen. La Candelaria is the historical district of Bogota. The old colorful houses were built in colonial Spanish Baroque style. The district of La Candelaria neighbors the Plaza de Bolivar, where many important public buildings and religious monuments stand. The capital, the seat of Congress. The courthouse is located here. It is the symbol of judicial power in Colombia. Beside it, the surprising Renaissance-style Liavano Palace has housed the City Hall of Bogota since 1910. The building has two stories with 32 bay windows and the palace has a mansard roof. St. Bartholomew's College is a secondary school founded in 1604 by the Company of Jesus. Over 400 years old, the school counts 28 presidents and other national figures among its alums. The Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception is also located on the plaza. 
In neoclassical style, it was built between 1807 and 1823 by the Spanish monk and architect Domingo de Petres, on the same site where three of the city's ancient cathedrals were built and successively demolished. Inside the cathedral is a total of 14 chapels with magnificent tombs devoted to various figures. In La Candelaria, the historical and cultural center of Bogota, the presence of numerous museums, theaters, and libraries lends great cultural interest to the city. Some of these sites are among the most important sites of Colombia and attract people from around the world. Like the Botero Museum, for example. Behind its beautiful colonial arcades, the Botero Museum, or the Modern Art Museum, holds 123 works by the artist and 87 works by foreign artists. Fernando Botero is a watercolorist and sculptor known for his round and voluptuous characters. An icon in the art world, his work is known throughout the world. He is considered as one of the most renowned living artists of Latin America. The Cristobal Colón Theater is the National Theater of Colombia. It is made of sculpted stone in neoclassical style. It was named Cristobal Colón in honor of Christopher Columbus and was inaugurated on October 12, 1892 to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the discovery of the Americas. A splendid ceramic sculpture commemorates this event. The building of the Colonial Art Museum is one of the most noble houses of Bogota. Built in the early 17th century by the Jesuit Pedro Perez, it was a part of the great architectural works of the Company of Jesus. The museum is located in the Study House, the oldest edifice in Bogota. The San Agustin Church, with its two Tuscan-style columns, was built between 1642 and 1668. It is an interpretation of the architectural styles of the Renaissance, derived from the art treatises of the time. The church contains major religious artworks from the colonial era. Today it stands as testimony to the artistic production devoted to propagating the faith in Colombia. It preserves a rich cultural heritage, represented in the exquisite sculptures, altarpieces, mural paintings, and paintings that decorate the different chapels. The sanctuary Our Lady of Carmen in the district of La Candelaria is devoted to the Virgin Mary. It was built in the 19th century. The temple was designed in Gothic Florentine style by the architect Giovanni Buscaglione with Byzantine and Arab touches that were inspired by his travels in Italy, Constantinople, Izmir and Alexandria. Note the alternation between brown and cream, the colors of the Carmelites. Today, it is a symbol of the Salesian community, an order devoted to the education of the youth, whose motto is, give me souls and take the rest. After having survived the war for independence, Bogota remained the capital of Great Colombia until 1830. The dissolution of this state brought about the creation of present-day Ecuador, Venezuela, and Colombia. Until the end of the 20th century, the history of Colombia was marked by a series of civil wars. Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, is crossed by the river Chao Phraya. The city is only situated two meters above sea level, and like Venice, it seeks one, even two centimeters per year. The name Bangkok has not been used by the Thai since it was founded in the 18th century, but for unknown reasons, foreigners continue to call it Bangkok. Its proper name is Krong Thep. 
The Grand Royal Palace in Bangkok, built by King Rama I in 1782 on the left bank of the river, is the unmissable monument of the city. It is the symbol of the Thai monarchy. Covering an area of 22 hectares, it is surrounded by four walls that are two kilometers long. The palace was the residence of the kings of Siam, ancient Thailand, until 1925. It houses not only the royal residence and throne room, but also a great number of temples. Guarded by Dvarapalas, which are half-human, half-demon figures. Sometimes armed with a club, they have a fierce appearance. The Grand Palace is divided into several quarters and includes many buildings, halls and pavilions, and the eclectic style is due to additions and reconstructions made throughout successive reigns, especially the reign of King Rama V. Like the Golden Reliquary or the Mondop style Royal Pantheon. The Temple of the Emerald Buddha is considered the most sacred Buddhist temple in Thailand. It is a powerful political and religious symbol. The main building holds the Emerald Statue of Buddha, which is strictly forbidden to photograph. This jade statue has three costumes of gold and gemstones, which are solemnly changed by the king himself according to the seasons. The wall surrounding the sanctuary is decorated with half-bird, half-human monsters and murals depicting the epic of Hinduism, which preceded Buddhism. A little further in, the buildings of Pra Maha Montaigne are located close to the center of the entire Grand Palace. This group of traditional Thai-style buildings was once the home of the kings. Its construction began in 1785 by the order of King Rama I. All the royal coronations since that of Rama II have taken place here. The new throne room shows a European influence. The reliquaries, called Shedi in Thai, are guarded by half-human, half-demon creatures, or Yaksas. Leaving the Grand Palace, there's a memorial dedicated to Rama I, the founder of the city. This general became the first king of the Shakri dynasty, which still reigns over the country. Thailand is a very devout country, and on almost every street corner there are a multitude of little temples where everyone can come in and make their offerings and supplications to Buddha. Near the Grand Palace, the National Museum, one of the most vast and rich museums of Southeast Asia, holds a superb collection of art objects. Once a palace, the site is made up of several ancient buildings in all their beauty. Dedicated to the preservation of the cultural heritage of Thailand, the museum exhibits collections of art, artifacts and objects discovered in ruins or during archaeological excavations. One of the museum's pavilions exhibits ceremonial objects, and a gallery is dedicated to the history of art. One can also see the Queen's Room. The Wat Po is one of the largest and oldest Buddhist temples in Bangkok. Its construction began in 1788 on the site of an older temple, and it was expanded under the reign of Ram III in the 19th century. The Wat Po houses a gigantic reclining Buddha.
The statue, entirely covered in gold leaf, is 45 meters long and 15 meters high. It represents Buddha on his deathbed, about to enter total nirvana. Its feet are inlaid with mother of pearl, showing the 108 states of Buddha. This is a place of great devotion, and everyone can leave their offerings, like flowers, incense, water, or rice. The temple complex holds many galleries between which it's nice to wander. In one of them, one can admire golden statues of a standing Buddha, something quite rare. The Wat Po is certainly one of the most beautiful places in Bangkok. Dedicated to meditation and plenitude, it also houses, since 1962, a famous school of traditional medicine. By its latitude, Key West is the most southern city in the United States. It is located at the southwest tip of the archipelago known as the Florida Keys. Originally called Calle Hueso by the Spanish, meaning Bone Island, because of the numerous bones they found there when they arrived, its name was changed to Key West by the English. The city center is located on the western part of the island in the old historic district, and today, Key West mainly lives off the tourism attracted to its remote location and colonial past. First frequented by artists and intellectuals during the 20th century, Key West quickly attracted a wealthy Bohemian population, and starting in the 1980s, a large number of tourists drawn to its ambience and its largely intact architectural heritage. Key West is situated at the confluence of the waters of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Living off fishing, treasure hunting, or cigar manufacturing, the inhabitants here led a sheltered life, hidden from development until the construction of the railway, and then Route 1 in the 1930s. The maritime tradition of the island can be seen in the recently restored historic district of the port. And these days, this is where you organize a day at sea. Because, with its deliciously gentle climate and crystal clear blue skies, the island is famous for diving, deep sea fishing and water sports. After a day at sea, Duval Street is the meeting place for all of Florida's partygoers, especially on the weekend. Numerous restaurants and bars welcome tourists, like Sloppy Joe's, where the rum runs like water. Key West has acquired an international renown because of the people who frequented it and lived there. Here, we feel the presence of Ernest Hemingway, a great fan of deep sea fishing and daiquiris, cocktails made with rum and lemon juice. Hemingway liked to come to Key West and to mix with the local population to watch boxing matches or arm wrestling competitions. This is where Ava Gardner gave Hemingway the nickname Papa. Later, numerous Hollywood stars frequented the island. Hemingway arrived in Key West at the end of the 1920s, just after he had married his second wife, Pauline. In 1931, her uncle bought the house on Whitehead Street, that we visit today as a wedding present for them. It was built in the Franco-Spanish colonial style that was popular in New Orleans in the 19th century. Previously, Hemingway had only lived in a simple room in the city. The house is decorated with furniture that his wife bought in Europe, notably including Spanish antiques from the 18th century. 
Hemingway liked to host, and the famous writer John Dos Passos, a friend of the family, came here with his wife to visit the couple on several occasions. This is also the house where two of Hemingway's sons, Patrick and Gregory, grew up. It is estimated that Key West is where Ernest Hemingway wrote nearly 70% of his works, including A Farewell to Arms, Death in the Afternoon, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, Green Hills of Africa, and For Whom the Bell Tolls. He worked very early every morning in a studio that was set up on the second floor. The author loved cats and gave them the names of stars. Their cemetery is a curiosity. One of them had six toes on each paw, and its lineage was strong because the cats living there today bear the same mark. Hemingway had the first pool of the island constructed. It cost $20,000, an extravagant sum in the 1930s, but enabled the famous writer to invite other celebrities. But after his divorce in 1940, the writer rarely came to Key West, preferring Havana from then on. Visiting the city, one discovers that the center of Key West, the western part that makes up the historical district or old town, is truly one of the architectural and botanical jewels of America. The architecture there has conserved a character that is typical of the late 19th century with a strong Victorian influence. There are bungalows, single-tenant shotgun houses, and one-story houses, all made of wood and wood paneling. Even on the smallest streets, the local population has restored the old houses and adorned them with luxurious trees and tropical flowers. They are decorated with wood carvings, cornices, railings, and often surrounded by a porch or a veranda, and painted in pastel colors. In one of them, the writer Tennessee Williams wrote A Streetcar Named Desire. On one street, a house attracts our attention. It's the former residence of the American President Truman, where he set up his winter quarters in the 40s, which the press quickly named the Winter White House. In Key West, when the sun begins to set and shines with its thousand flames, everybody gathers, and to the sounds of musicians, jugglers, mimes, and other artists, the city takes on a new rhythm, that of night. The streets come back to life on the terraces of cafes, bars, pubs, and restaurants. And in this city at the edge of the world, one can easily imagine quitting the city life and doing so for good. The Songhuang River, or Perfume River, separates the old city of Hue in the north from the modern-day city in the south. Hue was the imperial capital of Vietnam from 1802 to 1945. At the heart of the city, the Trang Chien Bridge crosses the Perfume River. It is composed of six steel arches that are each 403 meters long. The bridge was built by Gustave Eiffel during the French Protectorate at the end of the 19th century. But since Hue was the imperial capital of Vietnam, the city enjoys great prestige and has a special flair which can be found in its opulent palaces, cuisine and music. The old city is located within the surrounding walls of the Royal Citadel, built on the banks of the river in 1805. The old city is surrounded by walls rising six meters high and includes many bastions over a perimeter of 2.5 kilometers. The city is surrounded by large moats. It is accessed through four fortified gates, each equipped with a bridge. A symbol of the imperial city of Hue, 
the Gate of Noon was the supreme administrative site of the Engrian dynasty. From this gate, which comprises five entrance points, the emperor announced his orders and decisions to his civil servants and to the people. Built in 1833 by Min Mang, this central gate, as well as the bridge, were used exclusively by the emperor. The former seat of the imperial government and the main attraction of Yue is a sprawling complex of temples, pavilions, moats, walls, and gates. The royal road crosses through the Forbidden City and includes the most important buildings of the former capital. The Palace of Supreme Harmony, the Throne Hall, and the Imperial Museum where the royal garments are on display. Around this central access, hundreds of structures were built in harmony with nature. For this complex is located within a park. The Forbidden Purple City includes numerous pavilions and palaces linked by many long galleries that enable movement to and fro. The Royal Theatre is another landmark of the Citadel. Performances of traditional music of the Imperial Court are still held here today. The music of the Imperial Court is listed as an intangible cultural heritage since 2003. The Royal Theatre's mission is to preserve and promote the ceremonial music, Imperial dances and traditional songs of the Huey Opera. In the 19th century, the festivities and music of the former capital underwent great development. At the royal court, celebrations such as the celestial ceremony and the terrestrial ceremony and even the traditional Tet festival have their own specific rituals. It is court music. Here, in the theater, the decorative art and motifs which are so reflective of the royal Engrian dynasty are at its peak. The Royal Gardens of Hue are famous. Each building has its own quiet garden and pond. The two western and eastern pavilions were reserved for the mandarins, the regional leaders, who were being received in the palace of the king's private audiences. During French colonization in the 19th century, Hue was the capital of Annam, one of the subdivisions of French Indochina. The monarchy was maintained under trusteeship, and France retained Hue as the imperial city until 1945, the year in which Emperor Bao Dai abdicated. Located in the heart of the imperial city, the Forbidden Purple City was devoted exclusively to the emperor's personal use. He had a very busy private life. Up to 500 concubines stayed here, as well as an army of eunuchs who supervised them. In this vast area, the details of the restored woodwork give a sense of the royal court's opulence. The Queen Mother's Palace is accessed by crossing through many gates whose colors have become dull and which used to punctuate the path from the Forbidden City. In the hall, the people who were summoned took a seat in these chairs. The nautical pavilion was built as a resting site for the Queen Mother. It represents the height of Asian Zen.
Today, the citadel of Huey maintains the appearance of a former feudal capital, where buildings and construction stand in perfect harmony with nature and with the country's cultural traditions. With a heritage worthy of a national treasure, Huey is the symbol of Vietnamese culture. Meknes is one of the great cities of the kingdom. Under Moulay Ismail's reign around 1700, Meknes was the capital of Morocco during the Alawite dynasty succeeding the Saidians. Moulay Ismail made Meknes his capital city for strategic, political, and geographical purposes. This Moroccan Louis XIV raised 40 kilometer long ramparts and looted the ruins of Volubulus and the El Badi Palace of Marrakesh to build his imperial city. Some of the ramparts gates are exceptionally beautiful and make Meknes the capital of grand gateways. The Bab Mansur gate was built in 1732 by a Christian architect who had converted to Islam. Considered as one of the most magnificent works built under Moulay Ismail, the gate is a wonderful marriage of geometric combinations with colors. The gateway gives an access to the Kasbah situated on the El Hadim Square. The Alawite dynasty has ruled Morocco since the last Saadian sovereign's death in 1659 and keeps ruling the kingdom today. In Meknes, the souk covers half a dozen main streets. It is a very lovely and more peaceful place than the souks in Marrakesh or Fez. It was not until the late 17th century and the arrival of the second ruler of the Alawi dynasty, Moulay Ismail, that Meknes became the number one of the imperial cities. Built in the 14th century by Sultan Abu al Hassan from the Marinid dynasty, the Madersa is a Quranic school offering law and Muslim religion courses. It is a marvel of Islamic architecture. The central courtyard is a symbol of the Eastern elegance. The fine enameled faience mosaics and the gorgeous cedar wood carvings in the ceilings are remarkable. There is a student room behind each small wooden window on the first story. Adorned with its zalij, sculpted stucco work and wood carvings, the courtyard is the jewel of the Medersa. Eventually, from the terrace, there are unrestricted views over the Medina and the Great Mosque's minaret. Meknes is full of mosques with beautiful minarets. This is why the city was given another nickname, the City of a Hundred Minarets. Moulay Ismail, founder of the Alawite dynasty who ruled Morocco in its capital of Meknes for 55 years, died in 1727 at the age of 82. He has the greatest longevity as an absolute monarch unto this day. Built in 1703, the mosque has become the mausoleum where his body lies at rest, surrounded by one of his wives and two of his sons. Moulay Ismail had no less than 500 concubines, with whom he had several hundred children, 1,042 more precisely, at the end of his reign. The mausoleum is one of the few religious monuments open to non-Muslims in Morocco. A series of patios lead to an ablution's courtyard where visitors have to take off their shoes because of its proximity with the holy place. We arrive then in the splendid mausoleum antechamber. There, we can see, without entering because the access is restricted, the Sultan's richly decorated funeral chamber. Restored in 1960, the mausoleum has preserved its former glory and authenticity.
The Darjamai Palace was built in 1882. It belonged to the Grand Vizier of Sultan Hassan I in the late 19th century. Its building lasted two years and reflects all Morocco's past splendors at the turn of the 20th century. Not far, an impressive building dominates the southern part of the city, the El Mansour Palace. Its name evokes another famous monument in Meknes, the Bab Mansour Gate. Indeed, the building of both monuments was supervised by the same architect, the converted El Mansour. The palace dates back to the end of Moulay Ismail's reign. The ground floor was used as a shop and the upper floors as a noble residence. In addition to its role as a watchtower and bastion, the El Mansour Palace could be used as an arms depot, grain tank, as well as a princely residence. Its height varies between 12 and 14 meters. You can see here that time has wrought changes. The only remains of the Moulay Ismail Palace are the big granaries, used to store the city's foodstuffs together with the grain and hay destined to feed the monarch's 12,000 horses. A complete subterranean pipe network supplied with fresh water through norias driven by a mule maintained the food stocks at a constant cool temperature. According to the writers of the time, Moulay Ismail's excessive fear of being besieged could explain the unimaginable reserves of the granaries, which, when fully filled, could have fed the whole city for 20 years. No siege actually lasted more than a week under his reign. As evening comes, the crowd starts to gather for this unmissable convivial event. In the main square, there is something in the air, like a fresh breeze, a sense of freedom. Southeast of Africa, Nosy Bay is the largest island off the coast of Madagascar in the Mozambique Channel. In fact, Nosy Bay is an archipelago of volcanic origin made up of small islands, each one distinct. The cluster has beautiful beaches, perfect for a stroll in the shade of the coconut trees. Even though the crystalline waters call us to swim, it is now time to travel on to discover the island. The inland, amongst a range of greens, from the lightest to darkest, reveals its picturesque villages in which live a very mixed and multicultural population. Nonetheless, the Antakarana and the Sakalava are the two main ethnic groups of this region. Here, local traditions exist peacefully with Buddhism, Christianity and Islam, these new religions that came with the influx of immigrants. Mostly farmland and with virtually no industry, Nosy Bay Island is a poor region. Infrastructures such as roads or water conveyance are still lacking despite the development of tourism over the last 40 years. There are forests and rice paddies, but the island is best known for its ilong ilong plantations. This ubiquitous plant, originally from the Philippines, is cultivated for its fragrant flowers from which we extract essential oil that is highly valued by the cosmetics industry. Nicknamed the Perfume Island, Nosy Bay has many distilleries scattered across it, and enchanting scents come from everywhere on the land. Thanks to its geographic location at about only 15 kilometers from the Madagascar coasts, Nosy Bay is protected from trade winds and cyclones. It is the best mooring site of the Indian Ocean. 
Because of this, the region is naturally predisposed to be a meeting point between civilizations and incoming trade from all areas. Hellville is the main city. It has old houses built in the 19th century and passed down as legacy. Before, by virtue of its strategic points in the Indian Ocean, Nozi Bay, the village of Indians of the Kingdom of Sakalava, became a trading post for the traffic of slaves. Today, these remains show their former presence. We can see the old Navy cannons. We must now leave Hellville and civilization in order to see the pure and untouched nature we seek. The mangrove swamp is an extremely protected ecosystem of sea that possesses specific plants, mangrove trees, that only grow in the tidewaters of tropical regions. These particular spots are important sources of wood and fish for the coastal populations. Nozi Bay is an area of protected lands with sustainable development, parks and nature reserves where different rare and indigenous species are preserved. The island also preserves the authenticity of its villages, accessible only by sea. The inhabitants live almost entirely self-sufficiently, and rice is the main base of local food, along with fish and fruit. But the big attraction is the lemurs. The wildlife zones host many species, such as lemurs, but also snakes, non-poisonous, crocodiles, tortoises, and chameleons, as well as many types of birds and butterflies. Nozi Bay is also well known for its luxurious vegetation. Beyond the mangrove swamps and the marshes, the rainforest with its famous traveler's tree is the main landscape that visitors will see. Nozi Bay is surrounded by a constellation of little coral islands, one more beautiful than the next. We are approaching Sarabangina, the delight for the eyes, and the most beautiful of the Mitsio Islands. This mountainous island is a rare sight, a private island where its luxury comes perhaps more from isolation than from comfort. The island is a real living aquarium where the sea overflows in a wealth of color from over 100 species of fish and many species of coral, such as the spectacular sea fans. We need to suit up to dive. Once in the water, the enchantment begins. Nozi Bay, Enchanted Island, is famous as the number one tourist site of Madagascar. This is thanks to the quality of its services and its numerous tourist attractions. The magnificent landscapes and the panoramic views make Nozi Bay a unique and pleasurable vacation location. An island filled with land and sea activities. It has many hotels throughout its sites, each one with its own special talents and charms. Both the forest and marine life nature reserves of the archipelago offer rich encounters with nature that will take you away from it all. It is an environment filled with the intense perfume of flowers and inhabited by many indigenous species. A unique atmosphere, strong and almost magical, comes from this area of the world, listed as one of the most beautiful natural sites of UNESCO's World Heritage Programme.